Good morning, everyone. My name is Stacey Pitts Caldwell. I'm the Center Director for the Illinois Small Business Development Center at the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We are delighted to have Bo Steiner from the Small Business Administration, SBA, with us to provide important information and answer questions regarding the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which we're also calling EIDL application today. For those of you who are join, joining via Zoom, you can submit a question in writing at any point during the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, you can hover over the slides and it should pop up there. We will get to as many as possible after Bo's presentation. And just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website at Chicago Land Chamber Dot org. Before we begin, a few words from the President and CEO of the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce, Jack Lavin. Jack? Thank you, Stacy, um, and thank you, Stacy, for your leadership of the Chicago Land Chamber's SBDC. Uh, you're doing a great job, and we've obviously had a lot of questions and work these past couple of weeks, and, and uh, you are doing an excellent job getting information out to our members. This is Jack Lavin, President and CEO of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for joining this afternoon's COVID-19 webinar update. We are very grateful that Bo Steiner, District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration's Illinois District Office, has taken time out of his busy schedule to be with us and Bo has been a true champion for small businesses and worked closely with the chamber. He participated in our Senator Durbin webinar a week and a half ago, and he's here with us this afternoon. So we thank Bo for working with us and, and helping our small business community. During these unprecedented times, we at the Chicagoland Chamber understand how important it is for the business community to work with public sector agencies like the SBA. We, conti we continue to be in constant communication with our congressional delegation, in addition to our advocacy at the city, county, and state level to ensure that our region's small businesses receive the financial and regulatory relief they need today and in the weeks and months ahead. The chamber is here for you let us know what your current priorities are so we can be your champion and partner. And as I've said on other webinars, if you have any questions, concerns, issues, please feel free to email me at jlavin at chicagolandchamber.org. I also want to mention that Bridget Gaynor, who is part of Aon Corporation, one of our board members and a commissioner of Cook County government, uh, we'll be having a webinar this Thursday uh, with small businesses and local chambers. So please uh, look at our website uh, for that webinar upcoming. Now let's get started. Bo Steiner has been with the SBA since 2013 and leads SBA's operations across the state of Illinois. He and his team have been especially busy these past few weeks getting information out through forums and webinars like this while also working hard to ensure that Illinois' small businesses can benefit from the various funding programs available through the various relief packages that have been passed by Congress. He's going to talk through all of that today. As Stacy mentioned, you can submit a question at any point during the presentation by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will have some time at the end for Q&A and we'll get to as many as possible. And for those questions we may not get to, we will certainly uh, keep track of all those questions and follow up. So again, thank you to Bo Steiner for his leadership and for taking the time to speak to our small businesses. Uh, thank you again, Bo, and take it from here. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's great to be able to spend some time with our business owners who are really bearing a lot of the brunt of the challenges that 
we face right now due to the economic impact of the coronavirus and uh, really appreciate Jack's leadership in, uh, in helping all of you navigate this challenge, these challenging times. I'd also like to thank Stacy for all her hard work helping support small businesses directly through one-on-one -on -one engagement and advising and counseling. It's, it's really a great service that she provides and I uh, appreciate all her hard work to, uh, to help her small business clients. So as, uh, as Jack mentioned, my name's Bo Steiner. I'm the district director for the Small Business Administration here in Illinois. Um, and I think a uh, pretty educated group here, Small Business Administration, we're the only federal agency that's only focused on small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, typical circumstances, we focus on our conventional programs, but today I just wanna focus on some of our disaster response programs, just to give you some insight into what we've got available to help you. Um, I would note, and uh, I'm sh I know everybody's anxious to learn more about the impact of the CARES Act, which was signed by the president on Friday. Uh, there are many aspects of that program that while at a high level may seem uh, relatively straightforward to understand, the actual implementation of those programs is very critical to, uh, to really how you as a business owner are gonna engage, how you're gonna look at what program might be best for your particular circumstance. Uh, as you can imagine, with the bill being passed and signed on Friday, we are still working as the SBA on many of the procedures, the processes, and um, the really the marketing component to help you understand those programs, how you're gonna apply, all those sorts of things. So. Uh, please bear with us we're working very fast i don't think i've ever seen anything move as fast as it's moving in the federal government um, but i'm not yet able to really get into the nuts and bolts of the cares act largely so for the purposes of my talk today we're going to be pretty heavily focused on the economic injury disaster loan program uh, the uh, express gap financing program that we have and uh and you know some other other uh other things that questions that have come up that we wanted to cover so if we go to the slide deck um that would be awesome and get going into that so when i focus my focus here is the economic injured disaster disaster loan program and again i've got some details that are going to help you understand the program how to apply what's required so that as you go to apply for this program you'll have the information that you need. Uh, in this case, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is a working capital loan used to pay your typical business expenses. If you go to the next slide, that'd be great. Eligible entities may qualify for loans up to $2 million with interest rates at 3.75% for small businesses and 2.75% for nonprofits terms up to 30 years with payments deferred for one year. Um, eligibility is gonna be based on the size of the business, type of the business, and their financial resources. Next slide, please. So I did, uh, this is kind of the coverage that I have for the CARES Act. Basically, uh, President Trump signed into law the act which provides additional additional assistance for small business owners including the opportunity to receive up to ten thousand dollar advance on an economic injury disaster loan for emergency capital we are now updating our systems to implement this provision so small businesses can request an eidl advance when they apply for the loan the update will be available in the coming days in the interim period you can still apply for the full economic injury disaster loan but you will need to reapply for the advance when the system is updated in the streamlined application. Once updated, the advance will be included in your EIDL application process. I think the key thing here is if you've already applied to the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, you'll get a notification probably as early as the end of this next end of this week saying, hey, if you would like to request the EIDL advanced, go back into the system go through the application process, it's super streamlined, put your information in, and then you'll be, uh, you'll be, your 
your application be updated to support the uh, the advanced component. Um, you don't lose your position in your in the queue. So as many of you know, it's a first in first out program. You won't lose your position. It'll just update the information in your application so that it includes that advanced component. Next slide, please. So when you look at the types of businesses that are eligible to apply, you've got small businesses, small agricultural cooperatives, small aquaculture businesses, and most private nonprofit organizations. And the intent of those loan funds is to pay, pay fixed debts, payroll, accounts payable, other bills that could have been paid had the disaster not occurred. Now, I, I'd like to talk about some of the things you can't use the loan funds for because that seems to resonate more with people to understand the boundaries under which you're operating in this program. You can't use it to refinance an existing loan. You can't use it to buy a building or buy new equipment. It's for those working capital needs. Um, there are certain instances where you, for example, get uh, gap financing, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but generally speaking, you cannot refinance any, um, any existing uh, debt. Next slide, please. Collateral requirements. So generally, so economic injury disaster loans over $25,000 require collateral. And our preferred collateral from an SBA perspective is real estate. However, we will take other types of collateral when it's available. If there's no, if for example, the bank has first position on any collateral that you already have, SBA would take a second position. But if you don't have any collateral at all, that won't be a reason for a decline. So we'll be looking at cash flow. You know, maybe you're a, a service business that doesn't have a lot of, that leases your space, you don't have inventory, that sort of thing. Um, so you don't have a lot of collateral in hand. Well, that lack of collateral is not a reason why you'd be declined for that loan. Next slide, please. And a, a really important part of this is SBA's working capital loans are different from more conventional SBA loans. So typically through 7A, through the 504 program, you're working with a a uh, lender, a commercial lender, uh, or a certified development company to secure that loan. You're making application to that bank. The SBA guarantees those loans for loss. In this case, you are making, in the case of the economic injury disaster loan, you're making, a, you're making application directly with the SBA. So you'll go to our website at sba.gov forward slash disaster. There's and you'll go through the process. It's an online process. And when if you go there today, we just launched our updated online application. And you'll see that for COVID-19 economic injury disaster loans, there's a whole new streamlined process. It's online. Once you go through the process, it'll send you an email telling you that you're complete with the application. And then it goes to a loan officer for review there's no cost to apply. So you don't have to pay an application fee with the SBA. The intent is that this process is simple enough that you as a small business owner, um, you know, that we make it easy for you to just go in and apply yourself. You don't need to work through some other, um, a middle person to help you make application. If you are approved for the loan, you don't have to take it. So if you're going through the process, you come to the end, you're approved, and then, but you have other financing that might be better for your business, you can decline, no harm, no foul. Uh, and you, if you have an existing loan, whether it's a 7A or 504 or another SBA disaster loan, you can still apply and, and qualify for an economic injury disaster loan for this disaster. Next slide. So what defines small business? Uh, we're using traditional industry size standards. So that is based on the North America industry code system. And the SBA maintains certain revenue limits that indicate or qualify a business as small. 
So for retail or service, it could be anywhere from $8 million to $35 million would be considered, considered small. Construction for a general contractor could be up to $39.5 million. The trades might be a little lower. If you're a manufacturer and you employ 500 or fewer employees, you would qualify as small. Likewise, with wholesalers, 100 employees or less is considered small. So based on your primary industry is what your size standard would be. Next slide. So when we look at your application, uh, some of the criteria that we're going to look at, number one is credit history. So you have to have a credit history acceptable to the SBA. We're going to pull your credit report. We're going to look at your payment history, those sorts of things to assess um, basically that you are reliably going to repay the loan. Repayment. We're going to look at your financials year over year to see what your general cash flows looks like. So revenues, cost of goods sold, what's your general um, available operating capital so that we can make sure that if you took on additional debt load, or debt service, that you'd be able to repay it. And that's not based on your circumstance right now. We know that revenue's down, so your overall margins are thin, um, are, are gonna be thin or reduced you know, to nothing. So we, we get that. Third leg of this stool is you gotta prove that the your business suffered working capital losses due to the declared disaster. Again, that can be proved in a bunch of different ways, whether it's a loss of revenue, uh, your customers aren't paying you, but we're gonna look at your typical working capital load to assess what your needs are. Next slide, please. Businesses that are ineligible, businesses and nonprofits, I should say, Agricultural enterprises, so basically it's like a farm, any, anything that grows something or raises something for human consumption is typically going to be considered an agricultural enterprise and would be ineligible. So farms, um, uh, I guess farms that raise cattle for consumption, those sorts of things. Religious organizations are ineligible. Charitable organizations whose primary objectives are philanthropy and social well-being, gambling concerns, casinos and racetracks. These are, this is just a subset. If you go, when you go to the loan application, it has a whole list of all of the ineligible entities and you'll be asked to certify that you don't fall into any one of those uh, categories in order to continue through the process. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about how you apply. Go through the electronic loan application at sba.gov forward slash disaster. You'll click, there's a big uh, button, red button that says uh, request for assistance. You click on that and you go to the COVID-19 economic injury disaster loan application. When you go to that page, it walks you through the process. So you'll see there's certain fields that are required and it'll walk you step-by-step step through that effort. You can also submit paper applications if you're inclined. Uh, and if you need those paper applications, you can request them from SBA's Customer Service Center. You can call the Illinois District Office and we can track them down for you, but you can download the PDFs, do them on paper and send them in. We highly recommend going through the electronic process. It's going to be faster. Your information is going to get to the loan processor quicker, and you'll get a response in a more uh, timely manner. So the most efficient and effective way for you to get access to this working line of capital is to go through the electronic process. But if you are having problems, there's a lot of resources that we'll talk about in a minute, chief among them, the customer service center and uh, which has both a 800 number and a email address that you can reach out to. Next slide. Okay, one thing that's come up is uh, a lot of people applied before we went to this new system. 
in the coming days, a robocall will be going out to all who have applied to the EIDL program, letting them know SBA has received their application. This will include all denials. In addition, an email stating this, the same will be sent to all applicants. If we don't have an email or phone number, a letter will be sent. Bottom line, we want to let everybody know, everybody who's applied know, yes, we receive, know that we received their application and provide additional information for, um, for any other programs that might be appropriate up to and including uh, going through the application process for the EIDL advance. Next slide, please. So just a heads up, these are some of the documents that we recommend everyone have in hand. Well, some of them are documents that you would provide. Um, they'll be filled out as you go through the electronic loan application. But we're looking for a completed loan application, which you'll go through. It'll walk you through that. We're looking for a tax potentially may ask for tax information authorization, which helps us pull your tax transcripts, copies of your most recent business federal income tax return, schedule of liabilities, which you'll fill out also in the, in the system, personal financial statement, and then other information be, may be requested. One of the thing that's, things that's come up with this new system is we're not asking you to upload any documents right now, if we need additional documentation based on your initial submission, we will, the loan processor will follow up with you to secure that information and make sure that you have a secure process to acquire that, um, to, so that they can have that information in hand as they're making the decision. Next slide. We may ask for your most recent personal income tax returns, including all schedules for principals, general partners, or managing members and affiliates, basically looking at owners of 20% or more of the business. If you don't have the most recent federal income tax return for the business, then we will likely ask for a year end profit and loss statement balance sheet so that we understand last year's financials, 2019. Uh, we may also ask for a year-to-date profit and loss statement, as well as uh, information regarding monthly sales figures. So these are other things to have in your back pocket. If I could make a recommendation, one of the things that I, I recommend to everyone who's thinking about applying to this is a couple of things. Number one, check your credit report. Make sure that there's nothing on there that shouldn't be on there, that it was a mistake, things like that. Anything you can clear up uh, would be beneficial. Number two is to have access to all of your documentation, your, uh, you know, having access to all of your business tax returns, having access to your business's financial statements for the last year or two, having access to your per personal tax returns, especially those for all owners over 20%. Again, we may not ask for it, but just having it in your back pocket in the event we ask for them will streamline the process. Um, and uh, so the, having those in hand will be really helpful to you just in the event that we do ask for that stuff. Uh, also note that we are still learning the process of what they're asking for. The system rolled out last night. So there may be things that I mentioned that are typically, that historically have been required, which may not be required in the process now. So uh, bear with us as we wrap our arms around everything that's, um, that they're asking for now. Next slide. Okay, so the, the next thing I wanted to touch on uh, is other resources that are out there to help you. Uh, we mentioned uh, Stacy runs the Illinois Small Business Development Center at the Chicagoland Chamber. We have a number of SBDCs across the state that can help you with not only the application process, but also strategizing around steps that you may take as a business to uh, address the next two weeks, the next two months, the long term to make sure your business is as successful as possible. We also work closely with SCORE, which is an all-volunteer organization, the Women's Business Development Center, as well as the Business, or I'm sorry, the Veteran Business Outreach Center. 
Um, so you can find those organizations um, at our website at sba.gov forward slash local assistance. In addition, the district office is hosting twice daily training session, training slash briefing sessions on available small business programs, uh, typically at 11 and 3 p.m. And you can find more information about them at sba.gov forward slash IL. A key thing on this is we are constantly updating our information that we're providing during those training sessions. So as we get more information on CARES Act and implementation on that front, we will include that in those training sessions. So it's just gonna be a good resource for you if, if you know, in the next week you say, okay, I wanna try and make my decision about what is the best program for me. I would expect that we'll have more information by the end of the week, um, early next week. So expect inclusion of that information there. Next slide. Uh, tips before you submit your application, just, you know, making sure that you fill out all the forms in the, on the online application. It won't let you go forward. It's kind of one of those things where it's got the red fields or the red asterisks fields. So you can't really move forward until you put information in the, in the fields that are required. Um, if you do get requested for additional information, please, you know, if you respond to that as quickly as possible, that will help to expedite your processing. If you are approved for a loan and more funds are needed, you can submit supporting documents and request an increase. Likewise, if less funds are needed, you can request a reduction as well. And if the loan request is denied, you do have an opportunity to request reconsideration, which basically means you get to go back and make your case about why, for whatever reason they said that you didn't, uh, you, were, you were declined, that you can address those specific issues and potentially uh, through that process, get approved for the loan uh, when previously you were declined. Next slide. Okay, so that's a lot on the economic injury disaster loan. Uh, I did want to touch on the Express Bridge, Bridge Loan pilot program that was recently launched as well. So if you have a urgent need for cash while waiting for a EIDL decision and disbursement, you may qualify for an SBA Express Disaster Bridge Loan. Basically, if you're a small business who currently has a business relationship with an SBA Express lender, you can access up to $25,000 with less paperwork. It definitely can help you overcome the temporary loss of revenue and can be a term loan or used to bridge the gap while applying for a direct SBA economic injury disaster loan. Next slide. Terms up to 25 grand, fast turnaround, will be repaid in full or in part by proceeds from the EIDL loan. So this is a case where you can use the proceeds from an EIDL to basically pay off an existing loan. But if you didn't do that, maturity is up to seven years, 50% guarantee from the SBA, and loans can be made up to six months after disaster declaration. No collateral uh, and only one express bridge loan per applicant. So it's a, it's again, it's a new program that we just launched late last week to try and expedite getting funding into the hands of business owners. Next slide. Okay, a couple questions uh, just that we've been getting regularly and then we'll get into the questions that all of you have submitted and I see uh, nearly 100 questions on the chat. So we'll, we'll be busy the next half an hour. Um, I'm having technical problems. So some people have had some issues accessing the website we recommend deleting cookies, closing and reopening your browser. Um, basically what was happening is some browsers were pointing back to the prior, the prior page as opposed to the new page, which was uh, recently launched. Uh, my business just started recently, am I eligible? So you do, there's no minimum time a business has to be in operation. However, you do have to 
show that the disaster caused economic injury, meaning you have to show some kind of revenue and expense lines in order to demonstrate that, yeah, I'm suffering substantial injury due to the coronavirus. What's the minimum credit score? There is no minimum cutoff number. Credit score is just one consideration, but our underwriters use a number of factors in evaluating applications. So again, we try to evaluate all aspects of the business in order to hopefully uh, get people the funding that they need to pay their work and capital costs. Next slide. What if I own more than one business? What if my business has locations in more than one state? So generally speaking, uh, if you own more than one business, our guidance thus far, and again, uh, subject to change, but uh, our guidance thus far has been if you have two businesses that are in similar lines, so let's say you own two restaurants, then you would put in one application for both restaurants. Uh, if you, however, if you had two different business lines, so say you had two restaurants and then you had two childcare centers, then you would apply under separate header or separate applications for both of those. Um, so that's, that's the one case. Just know that from the standpoint of the $2 million limit, that's per owner, not per business. So if you had four businesses, you're still limited to that overall $2 million limitation. Uh, if you have locations in more than one state, then you would apply in the state where your headquarters or primary location is. So if your primary location is in Cook County, you would apply in uh, Cook County in Illinois. What collateral personal, personal guarantee is required? Uh, we typically do require personal guarantees, although there may be, you know, that's, uh, that's something that you'll work through in the paperwork when you're going through the process. If, uh, if collateral is available, it must be offered on loans over $25,000, but again, isn't a reason for a loan to be denied. Turnaround time, uh, right now we're being told that from application to funds being dispersed, it looks to be about a month, which is why that bridge loan can be a real asset as part of the process. Next slide. How will CARES Act affect your loan? Uh, so again, you know, I put this in here because I just want to make be clear. There are additional resources that are coming down the pipe that uh, that may be beneficial to you. We are still working through as an agency the implementation piece. Recognize that you know it was launched or it was signed a couple days ago. So I would expect over the coming week there to be a whole bunch more information that comes out that we can share about how to navigate uh, the various components, uh, the legs of the stool that Congress and the president put in place to address the business, small business needs due to the coronavirus. So uh, next slide. All right, so I put these, uh, uh, these websites up here because they're really great resources it's where you're going to get the real skinny on what's actually going on with small business programs through the sba uh, sba.gov forward slash disaster that's where you go to apply for the emergency or the economic injury disaster loan sba.gov forward slash coronavirus is where you'll find additional information as it becomes available on the additional programs under the cares act and then sba.gov forward slash IL is where you can go to get information from, uh, you can go for local resources. The SBA district office staff are here to answer questions, get you to the right resource, hopefully get you the information you need um, to, to support decision making as you go and evaluate the various programs that are available. You can reach us by phone at 312-353-4528 or by email, which I recommend at illinois.do at sba.gov. You can also reach our SBA Disaster Customer Service Center 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. 
at 800-659-2955. Note that if you've made an application to the disaster center uh, and you want a status update, you're gonna have to call the customer service center or email them because we in the district office do not have access to the loan processing system. So just uh, kind of level set expectations on that front. We can answer a lot of questions about the program, how you apply, those sorts of things. But when it comes to actually looking at the status of your application, that's gonna have to go through our customer service center. So. Uh, I think that's all the slides that I had, Stacy. If you want to go into questions, I know there are a lot. Yes. So I just want to let everyone know that we are receiving all the questions. And so we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, keep in mind the CARES Act information is still formulating and thus we will be collecting those questions and getting the information and I will make sure to send out sort of an update email after this webinar with some of those questions once we have the answers. Um, so I'm going to start with a few of the questions that were submitted in advance, Bo. One of them says, do I have to find my own bank to receive the funds or does the SBA send me to a particular bank? Yeah, so when you go through the application process, especially now with the new system, you'll put in your bank routing number and an account number where the funds would be direct deposited to. Okay, and is this application for the SBA 7A loan or is this something different? This is something different. This is a loan through the SBA's disaster loan program, longstanding program, just unique in that it's up being applied for the coronavirus, which is uh, different than a normal physical disaster. So it, uh, 7A is still there. So if you're working with a banker and uh, you can always go that route as well, but this is a different program that's direct with the SBA. Okay, and then we have another question that said, can I apply for um, an emergency loan if I'm a permanent resident of the U.S.? Yeah, so typically uh, U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents are eligible for the EIDL program. Okay, and then I had another question. It says, Many solo professional service providers are wondering if the loans apply to people like us. I've reviewed the forms and they appear to be very focused on companies who have inventory, commercial leases, and the like. What about service providers who work from home or do not have out of office or an office outside of their homes? Sure. So I think the key here, what you need to demonstrate is substantial uh economic injury from the standpoint of working capital needs so meaning that you'd have to show as part of the process uh revenue and uh, cost of goods such that you're showing the decrease in revenue is impacting your ability to pay those ongoing normal business costs that you have to pay um, there's certain caveats in there from a standpoint of a sole practitioner or a sole proprietor in that, you know, it can't be a hobby type business, but, uh, but it's still, you know, most sole practitioners, sole proprietors are going to be eligible to apply for these programs. Okay. And then there's several questions I think that's tied to that that I'm seeing in the chat and this pre-submitted question. Um, you mentioned 8 million to and above. So I just want to clarify that service-based businesses under $8 million in revenue can also qualify. Yeah, so that was kind of a different kinds of businesses will have different caps, right? So uh, I use that as an example. So if you're, most service businesses um, may cap out at $8 million of max revenue, annual revenue, but others in different industries, for example, um, I don't know, uh, electronic retailer may end up having a, a small business size of 16 million. So it just depends on the industry. Those were just examples of the range that it could be. Okay, that makes sense. And then the other, other question is, do we need to demonstrate that all available bank credit has dried up? Can we qualify for the loan if we still have bank credit available? Sure. So. 
you don't have to go to a lender and have them deny you in order for you to be eligible for this program. They're going to look at your personal financial situation to determine if you have other capital that's available that could, uh, where you could fund the, your working capital needs as opposed to coming to the SBA program. Um, that's basically the analysis that the underwriter is going to go through. Okay. Um, another question is how long does a small business have to accept or reject the funds if approved? I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to find out. Okay. And then those were the pre-submitted questions. So these are the questions in the chat. I'm going to go through some of them. Um, one is I have a tax lien. I'm in, I'm in an offer of compromise now. Can I still apply? Uh, so if, if you, the answer is uh, yes. If you are in a repayment agreement with the IRS, then yes, you can, um, you should still be able to apply for the program, be eligible. Okay. Another one, will everyone who applies for the advance of $10,000 receive it, or is it a lottery? Does this have to be paid back? Again, that's part of the CARES Act, and I can't really speak to the specifics on that as yet. Okay. And again, everyone, we are going to, all the questions that are related to CARES, we're taking note of. So please um, be advised of that. Are personal guarantees required for nonprofits is the next question, Bo. Typically, no, they are not. Okay. What would be some of the reasons in which a small business would be denied if you know of any? So cases where uh, business would be denied if they can't show that they have adequate, they can get to adequate cash flow in order to repay the loan um, would be one, one big issue that we would look at. Um, as far as other reasons why uh, a business would be denied, honestly, there's a pretty complex process and evaluation that the underwriters go through that I'm certainly not, uh, <laughs> I'm not qualified to to get into because it is um, a pretty robust process that they employ. Okay. For a service business, can accounts receivable be used as collateral? Uh, typically, we don't use accounts receivable as collateral. Uh, but again, as, as I mentioned, lack of collateral is not going to be a reason why you won't be for the loan. So, um, so that shouldn't be a uh, like that, that shouldn't be an issue. Okay. The next question is, if I have already submitted my application and need to make updates, should I wait until I'm, I'm contacted or how would I be able to update the application now that I've submitted it? So that's where I would reach out to the customer service center and contact, talk to a customer service agent who can help you navigate that process because that's an internal process to our, our loan center and they can help with that. Are there any conflicts or restrictions in applying for this loan along with anything else related to COVID-19? So, uh, I mean, as far as what the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and any like state or local programs, I'm not aware of any. Uh, I think that's a big question about the some of the CARES Act implementation that we just don't know yet. Okay. If I own a restaurant, do I apply for the loan through my bank or strictly through the SBA? I think you covered this one, but just to make sure. Yeah, for the economic injury disaster loan, you apply directly with the SBA. Okay. I run a seasonal business and we won't be missing any revenue until May, but by then we will probably be in dire straits. Can we qualify for loan for a loan prior to our season's actual start date? So in this case, for the economic injury loan, the qualifier, one of the key eligibility criteria is that you're, you can demonstrate that you are experiencing economic injury. Now, it's not to say that if you, for example, you know, you could demonstrate 
sales drop. So as of January 31st, your sales dropped off the cliff and you know that that, that translates into um, revenue losses downstream. You know, those are the kinds of things that I would look at as a business owner or even, hey, my, um, my customers aren't paying me. I haven't, you know, I, my sales have been okay, but you know, now I'm starting to see that accounts receivable age. Those are the kinds of things that I would talk to the loan officer um, in the application process. I think, uh, I don't know that it can hurt to go and at least apply if you see that coming down the pipe and explain that as part of your, as part of the process, the application and process. And even if they decline you up front, going through that reconsideration process to say, hey, this is why I need the funds. And this is the issue that I'm gonna face in three months or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, the next question is, we are a group equity resident owned nonprofit housing cooperative. If 50% of our members have lost income and rents, are we eligible for an SBA loan to maintain our staff and continue meeting operation expense, operating expenses? Uh, I mean, that's a, I don't know if I've heard that question before. So that's something that maybe um, we could take offline because it seems pretty specific. Okay, sure. And then we're getting more questions again in the chat just to clarify the difference between the 7A and the EIDL. Do you mind saying that one more time? I think we've got some, just we've got probably about 10 or 15 that just came through. Sure. So the we basically have two different buckets of of loan programs. One is our what I call our conventional SBA loan programs, which are the 7A program, which is basically a general purpose loan that can be used for everything from working capital to property acquisition uh, across, it runs across the range. Um, that's typically used in non-disaster circumstances. So you would work through an SBA approved lender to apply for and receive a loan through that program. The other loan program is the 504 program, which is for uh, buying property and or heavy equipment. And again, you would execute those loans through a uh, certified development corporation and a third party lender. That's distinct from the SBA disaster loan programs, the economic injury disaster loan programs, which are which are made directly with the federal government. SBA is the conduit. We underwrite these loans, we service these loans, and we pull funds to disperse against those loans from the US Treasury. So those, these economic injury disaster loans are only available during a declared disaster. In this case, the COVID-19 has been declared as a disaster across the country. And basically every eligible business, every eligible small business can apply to this program. Was that clear, Stacy? Yeah, it's pretty clear. And we'll make sure to capture that in the notes that we send out as follow-up as well. Um, another question is, what is the total timeline of the application process from the time that someone applies to when they may receive approval and closing? Sure. So right now we've been told that uh, from application to decision, so approved, denied is three weeks, three calendar weeks. From decision to disbursement can be anywhere from five to seven days. Now, um, there are some other aspects of it related to the CARES Act, but again, like the procedures on that, I don't want to put any information out until we get clarity on exactly what that looks like so I can get you all good info. Okay. Um, another question, can the funds be used to pay additional employees? Um, we've had, we have had to retool our model to now focus on home deliveries. So yeah, I mean, payroll is one of the applicable uh, uses of those funds, payroll, benefits, those sorts of things. So yeah, 100%, you could use it for that. Okay. Um, 
Another question from the chat is, I filled out the online, online application early last week. Is there something new that needs to be done with the launch of the new system? Sure. So, uh, so you should, having applied last week, you should receive an email call uh, to let you know that the EIDL Advance is available and advise you that in order to go through that process, you need to do X, Y, and Z. So it'll give you instructions on that. And I would expect that to happen in the latter part of this week. Okay. I think we addressed this one earlier, but just to, re just to make sure, if a business has availability on an existing working capital line of credit, will they be denied funds from the EIDL? Not necessarily. Um, that will be taken into consideration, certainly through the process, but not necessarily a reason for decline. Okay. And then can I do both an EIDL loan and an SBA 7A loan? Yes. Again, um, again, you know, I would say that these are general guidelines that yeah. I'm giving, but there's no reason because you have a SBA 7A loan that you can't also apply and receive an EIDL loan. Okay. There's a couple of questions about the process for the documents. I know you mentioned this earlier. I just want to reiterate, um, once someone has applied, they're not uploading documents anymore. So now they would need to just, and I'll let you take over, Bo, because I've got about 12 questions about that particular, the documents uh, section. Sure. So my understanding is now the system's not asking for you to upload documentation to support the application. So what's going to happen is you'll submit your application. It will go to, if they need additional, it'll go to a loan officer. If they need additional information, then they will reach back out to ask for whatever they need to make a decision. Okay. And this one is, is related to the personal guarantee. How will the personal guarantee requirement impact my personal credit score? I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to get back to you. Okay. All right. Um, and I think those are most of the questions um, that are asked. Again, the questions directly related to the payroll protection, the CARES Act, and all of those, we'll, we're taking those down. And so we will um, create a fact sheet to send out um, once we have the clear answers to those. Um, but Bo, I, there's one more question in here specifically about the bridge um, program. Is the applicant the operating entity or the beneficial owner? So, I don't know. I don't want to guess. So let me find okay. that out. Okay. Mm -hmm. No problem. And then we have another question and I don't know if we can answer this or not, but um, it says, why can't the money be used for equipment? Uh, the intent is that it's for basically to maintain the business's operations. Um, I mean, there may be some circumstances that are unique to, to the particular situation, but it's not intended to be something where you're able to expand your operations or develop new um, capabilities as a result of the loan. It's, it's basically, it's to kind of give it like a simple thing, it's like a keep a business in business loan, right? Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, the other question that we're seeing or that I'm seeing is about 1099 employees that are not on payroll. Um, mm -hmm. Have any advice on how to address that? Uh, we're pulling together some guidance for 1099s. Uh, my understanding is that they're uh, so, you know, I, I would have to get back to you on that uh, so that I can give you better, better information on what that looks like for 1099s. Sure. Okay. That's, that's fine. Um, I think, and I'm scanning, sorry, I'm scanning the questions to make sure we don't double ask. Um, 
Okay. So the the main the main theme of the questions are really around the smaller service businesses that might have revenues that are under like three million. Do you have mm -hmm. any advice on the way that they should apply or what they can think about um, would be necessary for them to apply? No, I mean, I guess from my perspective, it's really just having a good handle on all of your financial documents and and um, and all that, you know, really is is kind of the key here. Uh, the intent is that whether you're, you know, hundred thousand dollars in revenue or you're twenty million dollars in revenue, you know, as long as you qualify, that the process is relatively straightforward, and that you get from point A to point B in a in a reasonable fashion. So, just making sure that you've got all your documentation available, that your financial state your financial statements are available is probably what I the number one thing I would recommend. Okay, and then we have a question that says, um, how is the the amount to pay back determined? How the, much do you have to pay back on the loan? The loan value itself, how is that determined? How much they would have to pay back like per month or however, whatever the terms are to be paid back. Sure. So what they're going to look at is number one, they're going to look at what the individual business needs are. So that's what you're going to provide as part of the application process. They'll, assuming you're approved, you're approved for a certain amount. And then with the loan officer, you'll go through the terms, which could be up to 30 years. So whatever, you know, a 30 year note at 3.75% for the amount you have is what the payment would be. Okay. Um, another question says, I own more than one business, all with different EIN numbers, mm -hmm. but I am 100% owner of all three. The, business do, the businesses do have relationships with each other. For example, one leases a property from the other. Can each business apply for the EIDL? So, yes, uh, each business can apply. Uh, however, as a whole, in totality, that particular owner would be limited to $2 million maximum. Okay. Okay. I think that will do it for the questions. Um, I want to just make sure that, again, I'll say, we have all the questions that were submitted. It looks like we've got well over a hundred. Some of those are duplicate questions. Um, and we will make sure that the information that we currently have is answered and sent out to you. And those we are waiting on, we will hold those for clarification from the CARES Act and the like. And so if you have qu final questions, you can still submit them while we're, we are on the webinar right now. Um, but I do want to thank you, Bo, for clarifying. Are there any last um, words that you want to share before we head off here? Yeah, you know, I would just say uh, stay on top of our website at sba.gov forward slash coronavirus. That's where the latest and greatest info is going to be. Um, if you want to get in the moment updates from SBA Illinois. If you go to sba.gov forward slash updates, we are constantly sending out updated information as it becomes available to make sure that you can be as, form as informed as possible. So um, those are the two things that I would recommend. We are here to, tr to do our best to help you. Uh, and you know we understand that this is really unprecedented situation. So thank you all for everything you do to support our economy to support you know, your employees, your customers. It's incredible. Um, and you know, know that we have a passionate team at SBA that wants to do everything we can to help you be as successful as possible. So thank you all and uh, keep fighting the good fight here. Thank you, Bo. We appreciate all of your efforts and for taking the time out to answer these questions and provide this information for our small businesses. Um, for more information about the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a recording of this webinar, visit our website at chicagolandchamber.org. 
The Chamber will continue to bring updates like this one in the coming weeks. Watch the event page on our website or your email for details. Um, stay safe and healthy, everyone, and thank you for attending.